we're just going to do it here in the ring. Well, it is Monday, August 22nd. The Audible is on the air on Facebook. You can catch us on Periscope, and we go ahead and take your questions throughout the program uh, on Facebook. Just go ahead and send them in. We'll get to them, try to get to as many as we can today. Joining me now, John Kajemi. John, who is, uh, you kind of got your fingers in a little bit of everything here with the Miami Dolphins. <laughs> Trying to, but covered, covered game day, practice day, you, you name it, you do it. Uh, played at Pitt uh, after stepped in for, uh, for stepped in to fill Somebody those shoes of Dan, Dan Marino. Marino. Yeah, yeah those, pretty, are, those are pretty fun. small shoes to slip into. Yeah, reluctantly, he, he let me live with him my freshman yeah. year in, in Pittsburgh. <laughs> He and Jimbo Covert and a guy named friend of mine named Paul Dunn. So it was a lot of fun. That, those know, were big you, shoes. You know what, John? We, we were, I was talking with somebody this week when we were in Dallas in the bus uh, going to the the stadium, and the name brought was brought up was Tony Dorsett. And I'm going, geez, did Danny cross with Tony? Tony Tony came out a year after me in 1977. But you, you got to Pitt, man. That. That program was loaded. I mean, yeah. lo- Hugh Green was there. Yeah, Ricky yeah, Jackson. Danny was there. Ricky Jackson, Jimbo yeah. Covert. You talked yeah, about Bill Frelick was there. Yeah, Frelick, yeah. Sweeney, uh, Bill Moss. Uh, there was a lot of talent yeah. on those rosters going back. And even when uh, crossing over for me, Mark Stepnowski, who played for years yep. for the Dallas Cowboys, he was one of those guys that was a pillar for those guys yep. moving from college to pros. So uh, there was a lot of talent. Tony Saragusa was another yeah, guy yeah. up on the other side of the line. Mark Spindler who played in, in the NFL for years. So there was a lot of uh, a lot of guys that, that yeah. crossed over. Yeah, it was pretty pretty. Uh... Pretty heck of a team right there. Hey, and then you go on to, to, to Toronto. You play for the Toronto Argonauts uh, of the Canadian Football League. How difficult for was it for you to adapt to, to the Canadian game after after playing American football your whole life? I never could figure out that extra guy on yeah, the other yeah, right, side. Yeah. That always gets you as a quarterback, but you have to account for it. Yeah, there was uh, many different rules. I thought I thought one of the most intriguing was in special teams where you had no fair catches. Yeah. Uh, you had to pick up the football, and if it was punted into the end zone and and you didn't come out with it, you gave up a point. You know, so the three downs and and the unlimited motion, those were a couple things yeah. to to adjust to. I can remember Bo calling a play. I called trips right. I get up to the line. Everybody's on my left, and I thought I'd called the play wrong. Yeah. So I started going through my cadence, and all of a sudden they started wandering over yeah. to my right side. So it, it was a lot of fun, and I, I met a lot of good people yeah. up in, in the uh, in, in Canada in the Toronto area. You're a South Florida kid, St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, you got your start there, and. Uh, uh, and, and you're back here with the Dolphins, so it's uh, good for your family, good for you. I mean, you, you've lived here your whole life, so it's uh, it's got to be pretty good to be around here. You know what? It is fun. It is fun to, to kind of grow up somewhere and then be able to stay there and nurture relationships and yeah. be able to you know go into your profession and stay in, in the same community. So you have a lot of friends that uh, tease you weekly about yeah. what you say and what you don't say yeah. uh, now that you're on the other side of the microphone. But it is a, a great uh, luxury, I guess, for yeah. both of us, you know, try, kind of transplanting ourselves into South Florida and being able to uh, not only play football, but grow up and grow those relationships yeah. and into broadcasting and being able to talk about uh, our favorite football yeah. team. Yeah. Well, let's go ahead and do that. Uh, obviously, the big story out there today, uh, Mike Pouncey went down during the game, uh, was out. And I tell you, when he went down, I mean, you look at that bench. I mean, there was a hush over that bench. Everyone waiting to see. He came out, went back in not too long after that. Really never got much attention by the training staff. They kind of looked at him, talked to him, never went off the sideline and sat down, put his helmet back on and went out. So you kind of felt, okay, everything's about right, all right, the big guy. Things will be good. Well, uh, not quite so much. He's, he's had a, he had a hip surgery on his right hip, I believe. Now he's got some injury, you know, some, uh, some tenderness on that left hip. Not quite sure the degree of it. Uh, but there's a good chance this this injury, uh, with all the, all we've heard and talked about, could carry on into the regular season. So it's not something to be dealt with lightly. Uh, and now the Dolphins have to look for somebody to step in for the Pro Bowler, and, and that guy is Anthony Steen, a free agent from Alabama in 2014, was with the Arizona Cardinals last year. The Dolphins signed him now. Uh, he's been a guard his whole life. Right. The Dolphins said, hey, you know, you look more like a center to us, and so they, they put him in to the center position. And, you know, it's funny, last week we were talking in one of the production meetings and, and talking to the coaches, and we say, hey, who's jumped out, who's jumped out at you that, uh, that you've been surprised by? And they said, geez, this guy Anthony Steen. He says, you know, out of uniform, not much to look at. It doesn't look like he's a world beater, but all he does when you put him in there does does the right thing, makes the right blocks, does the right never, you know, doesn't make metal errors, does all those types of things. So they had, uh, you know, they were pretty impressed with him prior to this. Now they're getting an opportunity to see him uh, certainly on 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 Thursday night up in Orlando, and probably for a good part during that final game down here at uh, uh, at Hard Rock Stadium on September first. So uh, it's uh, certainly a big week for him. 
And the Dolphins need him to step up and play well. Well, I think it's unquestionably that that's a position of, of concern right now for yep. the Miami Dolphins. You go back, and I don't know if you felt this way, Bo, but when we saw uh, Steed go in for Mike Pouncey and Mike Pouncey going back into the game, I was like, no, I've seen enough of Mike. Yep. You know, maybe not expose him to that. But Anthony Steen is one of those guys who is not afraid uh, of the big spotlight. He's played his career at Alabama, yep. played in plenty of big games yep. uh, for the Crimson Tide. So I don't think that the bright lights of the NFL are going to maybe uh, shine too brightly for him. I think he's going to come in. He's worked hard. He's gone right from, you know, maybe the fourth or fifth guy going in to, to right behind Mike yep. Pouncey. You know, he's leapfrogged a veteran in Craig Gerbeck, and he's leapfrogged a guy, a younger guy, in Jameel Douglas, because you haven't talked about those guys yep. a lot. It's been Steen. So you, you got to cross your fingers about Mike for the regular season. Now, this is a, a good thing to go through and get him experience in the preseason over the next couple of weeks. But if he has to play week one, I don't see him playing a whole lot in that last preseason game because now the numbers yep. are dwindling. And one of the issues I thought, Bo, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this, is about about, we've heard a lot about cross training the the players at different positions whether it's at linebacker whether it's the mm-hmm. offensive line but a couple of weeks ago I was trying to run the numbers and I was saying well if if what happens if Mike Pouncey goes right. down you know because I don't think that Laramie Tunsil or, or Jermon Bushrod no. has ever played center and I don't know if Dallas Thomas and Billy Turner could ever right. play center no. so you've got to have somebody that can play guard and center and this is the fit although you find it in an odd way yep. you know how many linemen do you keep going down the roster well certainly with the injuries and you got to you, you got to try to predict you know what pouncey how long he's going to be out right. and certainly they they have a lot more information about that than we do i mean they know the inside and out of mike pouncey and where he's going to be but you know i think you know goodness thank goodness for them anthony steen was there playing as well as he could and look, he's going to get the opportunity this Thursday against Atlanta. It's one of those games where the veterans are going to play probably three quarters anyway. So he's going to get a lot of work against Atlanta starters, you know, not against second or third teamers. He's going to be going against the starting guy. So he's going to get a chance to test himself against that kind of talent. And the team's going to get a good look at him and see what they need. You know, I've been talking to the coaches a lot during this uh, during this training camp period. And, you know, it's it's. They don't like to see errors, but they they don't mind errors because it gives them a coaching point. It gives them some work. And a and a guy like Steen is a guy that look, you know, he's going to make his mistakes. But but from, from everything I've heard from the coaching staff, he's a smart guy and can adapt. So sometimes you need to make those mistakes so they can be corrected, so you know how to elevate your game. And it's something he's going to have to do and, and do it in a hurry. We got uh, you're listening to the Audible here. Uh, we're, I'm with uh, John Congemi. I'm Kim Bocamper. Uh, you can go ahead and get your questions in. Just send them in via Facebook. We'll get to as many of the questions as we can today, whether it's about Mike Pouncey, whether it's about anything that has to do with the Miami Dolphins. And, and let's move on from that a little bit. We'll get back to it, and, and I'm sure it'll be something we'll continue to touch on through the program. But, John, let, let's look back at, uh, at the game uh, last week on Friday, Dallas Cowboys. Got an opportunity to see that offense for an extended period of time. I, I think we saw an offense that, you know, unlike the week before, we're able to get in there, kind of catch their breath, calm down a little bit, and get things going. And, and I think we saw a lot of good things out of there. Uh, we saw something we didn't see the week before out of the offensive starters, and that was protecting Ryan Tannehill when we went back to throw. Laramie Tunzel steps in. Jermon Bushrod goes into the right guard situation. Personally, my opinion, I think that's the way the season is going to start out with those two guys in those spots. I think the team is better in, in you know under those circumstances. And, and quite frankly, I'd like to see him kind of work that way throughout the rest of training camp. But you're able to get that going. The one thing we didn't see out of the offense that I think we'd like to see a little bit more, a little more of a running game. Uh, I think that if, you, if, you're, if you're looking in, you know, at the offense and saying, geez, that, that, that's one thing that, uh, that really didn't show up uh, as well as we wanted to out of that first unit. Well, one of the questions that were posed in the locker room today, Bo, to Arian Foster was, how did you improve from week one to week two? And Arian Foster said, hey, we got a first down. Yeah. You know, that, that was pretty good. And, but I agree with you. I, I like the offensive line and, and the playing time and the rotation in that game, too, against the Dallas Cowboys, against their ones. When you have Tunsil, who needs the experience, yeah. who's going to be your pillar on the left side and I agree I'd like to go with Bushrod on the right side Tunsil on the left side and, and have at it boys get in there and play and mix it up and get better and get ready for the, on the road yep. it's September 11th I thought the offense moved the football I thought Ryan Tannehill was very accurate we know about his toughness we know about him throwing on the run he does that very very well but I thought his accuracy was really good especially in the red zone he gave yep. his guys chances they didn't always come down with it but they he gave his guys chances to to catch the football and make some plays and I like 
like the relationship that's emerging with Kenny Stills. Yes. I think there's somebody on the outside, whether it's Devontae Parker or Kenny Stills, and we saw that in game two of the preseason, take some pressure off of Jarvis Landry because he's going to draw that third down coverage. Somebody has to win in man-to-man situations on the outside or inside or in motion. You've got a big body in, in Devontae Parker, but I, I really like the camp that Kenny Stills is having, catching the football, running routes, putting his head down and going to work. Yeah. I think that's the biggest thing for a guy trying to make the next step. And I think Kenny Stills is it fits into that category very nicely. It's funny. This, this is a different Kenny Stills than we had here last year. I think he was kind of feeling his way around a little bit. And, you know, Jarvis was getting a lot of attention. And he, he I think he maybe felt like the odd man out. You know, had some opportunities early and didn't really take advantage of those opportunities. But boy, I tell you, this training camp, he, he's active. He's become a vocal leader. He's been a guy that gathers up those young receivers, works with them, shows them how to be a pro. And then you saw it pay off on, uh, you know, on, on Friday night. Starts out the game with a 55-yard catch uh, and then gets in. And John, this one thing, I watched that. You know, they, they ran that play where he got the touchdown. And typically it's that fade, right? He yeah. runs a little fade. And, uh, and maybe this is something new. Maybe I'm just, you know, but instead of throwing the high fade, Ryan kind of threw it behind the defender's back, and, and Kenny Stills kind of kind of slid around right. him and caught the ball behind he, and underneath, which is a different way of throwing that ball that that I haven't seen from Ryan, at least at least in the in the near past. Well, I'm not sure if that was by design, but you know, a lot of times those defensive backs, you all you gotta see. do is get it close because yeah. no one's turning their head around yeah. to locate the football. So I, I agree with you. It might not have been by design, but it's something that it's almost like a back shoulder throw to the outside. Yeah. Only this one was to the inside. And and Kenny Stills, I credit two people. I credit Kenny Stills for going to work, but I credit his position coach, Sean Jefferson. Mm-hmm. I think he's getting the best out of this room that anybody has in the last seven years that I've been around this, this organization. This is a guy that goes to work every day. He's demanding and, and he's fair. But he wants to get everything out of his receivers on every day, on every rep. And I think that carries over. I think it really carries over to the way that whole group carries themselves. Yeah, and I, and I like the way he goes about his business, talking about Sean Jefferson. He's got something to say after every play, after every drill, after everything, whether it's, hey, tuck the ball away, do this, do that. And, and then, you know, has a little, uh, you know, jaws with his guys a little bit, comes out in pads That's and a right. helmet and – you know, I haven't, I have never seen that no. in the, in the, I used to have those old offensive linemen, offensive line coach. Every now and then they'd flip that hat back they'd and get down, get down the, the stance, stance and, and, you and then you hit bloody. them and crack their head open <laughs> and then they, right. and they're pissed at you for the whole rest That's of your career. The offensive line coaches are, are universal, I think, throughout the. But, well, evidently, Sean Jefferson got. He must football. have a little bit of a little bit of that offensive line coach That's in him right. to pull that. But yeah, did a good job, and Kenny's done a good job getting to where he's at right now. And you look at Kenny Stills, and you look at Devonte Parker, and all of a sudden, you know, you you look at the offense of Adam Gaze, it's not a down-the-field offense, but those are two guys that can go downfield. You know, he wants to play a short game and then hit the big one when you can. Now you got two guys down there, I think, that can go ahead and, and, and help you out when you want to get some some length as far as your uh, offensive passing game is concerned. You're, you're uh, watching the Audible here on Facebook. If you want to go ahead and uh, get your questions in, go ahead and send them in. We'll get to the questions. Uh, we're here every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, beginning at 4.30. We're with you from 4.30 to 5. So you can go ahead and get what you, uh, what you want. Uh, where are we at here? Oh, where are we at? I don't know where we're at here. We got some questions coming. I got questions, but I'm not sure where, where these are from. If they're from the day before, I'm not sure where these questions are. But uh, so I don't know. You're gonna have to help. My man Leon's gonna have to help me out with this one because I got uh, Leon's pretty savvy lost. about that stuff. What date is this, Leon? What day are we on? Twenty-two. Here? Twenty-two. Let's look for twenty-two here. Okay, here we are. There we go. There we go. All right. Rodney Self. Offense looks better. What is up with the defense? No pressure. And that's kind of the direction we were going. Before I answer, Rodney, before I answer your question, though, let's, let's go on to one thing. We talked about the injury to Mike Pouncey. We haven't talked about the injury to Matt Moore. Matt got dinged in, on a cheap shot. He was going down to slide. I don't know what they thought. Matt Moore runs about a 5 2. He wasn't they going he was, anywhere. He wasn't going anywhere. The guy takes a cheap shot. He's uh, out with the, uh, with the uh, concussion protocol yeah. now. Not sure. You know, some guys that takes a week, some guys it takes a month. We're going to have to wait and see that. That means that Brandon Dowdy, Zach Dysert, uh, they become big, bigger players in this uh, in this offense than we thought uh, than we thought previously. And you expect Brandon Dowdy to get a, a, a big dose of work and, and Zach Dysert. And then what do you do in in, in game four? 
maybe turn it over to those guys throughout the rest of the way. Well, I think they've got game four. There's yeah. no question in my mind. If I'm Adam Gase, uh, Ryan Tannehill doesn't touch the field in week four, and Matt Moore probably isn't going to be able to yeah. from the doctors to touch the field in week four. You've got to hope that he's ready for week one to back up uh, you know, in, in, in place uh, of Ryan Tannehill, something right. happening to him. But, you know, Brandon Dowdy's probably going to get a good bulk of work. I, you mentioned this before we started today's show about wherever Mike Pouncey goes, that's where Ryan Tannehill is right. going to go. And, and Adam Gase has said that repeatedly. Well, I don't see Mike Pouncey coming out and playing yep. in week three. So I would I would look for Ryan Tannehill maybe not to play much more than the first quarter, yep. if that, were, if that yes. were my decision. Because I don't think – I think you've seen enough. He's gotten enough really good work in practice. He's gotten enough in the scrimmages. He's gotten enough on seven-on-seven. Seven. They've done some work yep. in this training camp. And last week, with that offense asking to go and stay on the field and putting together a nice drive and getting really good red zone work. Yes. I, I think that's critical because that's been a place that the Miami Dolphins have been stagnant over the last couple of seasons. They've worked on it in training camp. They're working on it in the preseason games. So I think that Brandon Dowdy and Zach Dysart, a big chunk of the next two weeks are on their shoulders. And yeah, certainly you figure if that goes, if that's the way it goes this week, you would expect when they come in to, to, to take a big dose of the running game, see what these guys can do running the football. I, I do. Give them the opportunity to do that. Let, let's go ahead and finish the question, though. Uh, talk about the defense, and that was going to be something we talked about uh, today on the program. <coughs> Excuse me, the defense, not what we expected, very little pressure, um, and, and maybe more alarming to me than the lack of pressure was the inability, I want to say the inability to stop the run. How about the inability to even get a hand on some of the running backs as they made their way through the line of scrimmage? Well, getting off blocks yeah. and, and getting to the second level, not allowing these linebackers to make plays. I think that was the biggest concern watching the game. There were gaping holes. Yep. And it wasn't like these guys had a stop and start. They were going downhill, and they were hitting the second level uh, you know, within three or four steps. So the pressure is one thing, but being able to, to do your job up front and allow those linebackers to get off blocks and be able to make plays, that's the key to this wide nine. You've got a lot of room, but with that room comes a lot of responsibility. And I, I think it was the first time you saw Mario Williams out there. Mm -hmm. It was the first time you saw Dominic and Sue. You know, you're waiting on Earl Mitchell to get back. You're waiting on Cam Wake's return. So there's still a lot of question marks on that defensive side of the football. And, and I think one of the things Bo, I'll be watching for in week three of this preseason how many plays do the linebackers make in the running yeah. in the run game and and how how are their coverage you know how, how much room can they cover down the football field because that's going to be critical we, we've circled cornerbacks maybe and linebackers I think in this offseason working up to 2016 yeah. and seeing how that improvement on the defensive side works I think those are a couple areas along with that defensive front you want to see those guys maybe pin their ears back and, and get after uh, the Atlanta quarterback yeah you know and at some point guys have to Guys have to understand that my job. This is my job. Let me do my job. Right. Do my job and let the other guy worry about his job. Because you have guys that you know maybe supposed to maintain outside leverage. They jump inside. Boom! Ball bounces outside, and, and there you've got a problem. And, and and that to me is you know that's one of the hard things about being a defensive player. Is that sometimes you know you can make the play. But you're better off just maintaining your position and doing what you're supposed to do because once you once you once you kind of freelance a little bit, that whole defense opens up and it changes everything. So you like to see guys kind of mind their P's and Q's a little bit. If I got outside leverage, let me stay outside leverage. Inside, I got to stay inside. But you've got to play your rules on defense. If not, things break down in a hurry. And I think we saw some of that the other evening. Well, here's a, a perfect example of that. You know, you have Tony Lippett coming on a blitz to the outside. His one responsibility is just to close everything down on the inside. Right. Well, not only doesn't he able to, isn't he able to do that, but he runs right by the ball carrier, right. and and that opens a gaping hole off the left side. So if Tony's not even even if he doesn't make the tackle, if he's able to get a hand yep. and squeeze that running back to to the inside, right. there should be some help there. Yep. So it's just about going back to doing your jobs. If I'm if I've got outside contain and that's my leverage, and the ball carrier is to my inside. Boy, I just all I have to do is close down just and squeeze. slow down and squeeze. Up, you don't have to get too far afield. Right. Just squeeze it down and, and maintain that outside leverage so if it bounces back, you've, Somebody's got, you've there. got the freedom to jump outside and make the play. And yeah. it's it's you know, but it's it's everybody wants to make the tackle. And it's understandable. It's a very aggressive bunch. You're you're not you don't play defense if you're not aggressive. You want to chase after the football, but you know, you, you've got to maintain your job responsibility. If not, it makes it very tough. All right, let's uh Kevin Hackinson, are you concerned with the secondary and depth at that position? 
I'm going to kind of boil that down to cornerback because I think the safety position, pretty good pretty, pretty, the pretty good shape there with Caduce and with uh, with uh, Rashad Jones. So I think you're pretty good there. <clears throat> cornerback position is a concern. He continues. When will uh, Xavier Howard play? He was activated. He went out for pregame warm-ups. He dressed in a the uniform. They wanted him to go through that procedure. Uh, he was out on the field today going through some stuff. I would doubt very highly he plays this week only because he hasn't been in there that much. I do know this. Dolphin coaches are very, very anxious to see what he can do. He's a he's a guy that can play press coverage. He can play zone coverage. He's a he's a strong physical guy. He can tackle. He's got long. He's got length. All those things. He's a four four guy. So many things going for him. And the Dolphins love what they've seen out of him in the OTAs. Now he's got to get that opportunity to get in and get his reps in transition. John, you think he plays at all this week? I don't think so, but I, I do think he's going to work himself up, you know, yep. from, from teaspoons to tablespoons. You know, this is a guy that's going to go and get extensive work, I believe, in week four. He has to get out on the football yes. field, and he has to be able to get that interaction of, of bumping on the corner and using that press coverage and running with receivers. We've seen him work on the side. Uh, running straight ahead, he looks 100%. He's flying around. Moving around laterally, he's getting better. And I think we've seen that to, in today's practice where he was taking a couple one-on-ones in the red zone, taking a, a few plays down the field and being able to get back to regular a regular football routine. As fast as this medical staff and this coaching staff can get that done with Howard, that's as fast as he'll be yeah. able to get back at, at the cornerback position. Yeah, and you had Lippitt out there. You got Bobby McCain They're still, still out there working. Chiqua, who, Chiqua, who, was who hasn't? Yeah, the he hasn't had there. So they've got some guys back yeah. there uh, that they've got to deal with. But uh, and look, you know, Vontae Davis, uh, he went down for uh, for Indianapolis. They're out there looking. So you know that that uh, that market for cornerbacks out there is going to be a little interesting as we move forward. Steve Brazel says, uh, do you think uh, Isaiah Pede has a shot to be the number one running back? I would say no. No. I, I would say no, but I think he's got a shot to make this football team. Yes. He's ma- making some noise. Look, the, the, there, there's two battles out there in the running back position. One is for the starting job. That's between Jay Ajay, and, and that's between Arian, Arian Foster. Foster. And then beyond that, you've got Isaiah Pede, you've got Damian Williams, and Kenyon Drake, who has yet to make it, to the, make it on the practice field and has not played in the game. And, you know, He's kind of like the he's kind of like the guy sitting in the sideline that parades going by, and you know Santa Claus is almost coming around the corner. If you want to get out there and play, you better get out there pretty fast. But uh, um, it doesn't look like he's going to be out there anytime soon. At least my indications look that way. It doesn't look that way to me either, Bo. And, and I would think that Isaiah Pete is doing everything he can to make this football team. Yeah. And, and the way he's played over two weeks, he's going to make somebody's roster. He's going to get an opportunity, if not here at the Miami Dolphins, he's going to get an opportunity within the National Football League because he's looked really good in the games and on tape. Now, I think it's going to come down to who is a better special teams player, Mm -hmm. Isaiah Pete or Damian Williams. Uh, I don't think Kenyon Drake at this point is going to factor in. You know, this is, might be a guy that that finds himself on, on the injury list. Yep. You know, it, it might be a guy that you're not going to count on in 2016 because he's had injuries throughout his collegiate career that seem have have stalled his progression. And I think it's stalled right now with the Miami Dolphins. Well, and you compound that with the fact that you've got four guys out there competing at a very high, high level, level at that running back. It's one thing if you had, you know, two guys that were competing and other guys, are, you know, dropping balls, not doing anything. But, you know, everybody that's touched that football in that running back position, certainly in the in the, the backups. Are, have, they look uh, good. They, they've looked very good, yeah. Uh, you're watching the Audible. John Kajemi here, Kimbo Camper here. Uh, you can go ahead and get your questions on Facebook. We'll continue to take uh, some of those questions. Are you concerned? This is from Tony uh, uh, Bellamio, are you concerned about Kiko Alonso not being able to separate from blocks? Mm-hmm. My answer would be yes. Uh, I think we saw him in game one miss a miss a critical tackle. Down in the uh, red zone. You know. and, and look, you know, to me, how these guys get ready to tackle in this day and age with you know the lack of, of, of full pads, lack of full contact at practice, you know, I think I think I think I think tackling throughout the National Football League is not going to be the level where it should be until probably week three, maybe week four. So I think this is epidemic throughout the National Football League at this time of the year. But the question about separating from blocks, I think based on what we saw uh, on Friday night, I think that's a question for Kiko Alonso. Uh, I think it's uh, for Jelani Jenkins and Cole Amici. All three of those guys need to find a way to 
you know, get off the blocks, make plays, and make plays going downhill rather than the other way. We've seen over the past two seasons Dolphin linebackers making plays, but making them six yards down the field, yeah. seven yards down the field. We need guys that are at the line of scrimmage. You need more tackles for loss. Linebackers getting their hands on the football, stripping the football, getting some forced fumbles. And I think the one thing you do like about Kiko Alonso is his – Athleticism. The one thing we haven't been able to see, and I kind of agree with you and Tony, is can he get off blocks? Can he make an open field tackle? And can he be instinctive enough to make plays behind the line of scrimmage? I I hope we see that in week three. I hope that that appears not only with Alonzo, but this entire linebacking core, because what we've talked about, it's very difficult to replicate a game at practice uh, this day and age. You can't tackle anybody to the ground. You can't really be that overly physical. So the game switch turns on and all of a sudden you're going back and you know you have to revert back to your fundamentals so doing your job getting in the right gaps and being able to make plays that's something all of us will be looking for at a linebacker for this week i know i had a chance to to, to talk to kiko a lot during the off season and and he's committed i mean he's committed he wants to be the best he's working he's doing all these things but you know and again some of these times it's just reps and you know they're they're going to that Wide tackle nine, whatever they call it out there. All they're doing is widen the defensive yeah. ends, basically, which really shouldn't affect the linebackers that much uh, as far as their game is concerned. But that that whole group needs to, to play better. And look, it was a concern going into the draft, and we all knew it, and they really didn't address it that much other than the Kiko Alonso trade when he came along with Byron Maxwell. Maxwell. So uh, you know they, they've got to find a way to stabilize that place, and they've got to find a way to get those guys making plays out there. All right, here's another one, Tom Collins. Could Deion Jordan be be help for the linebacker core? I'm going to say very simply, no. His body type is a defensive end yes. right now. And for him to get on the field, even though that's a crowded position, uh, his chances are when he gets healthy, he has to produce. And if the Dolphins are going to give him that opportunity, he's working hard off to the side to give himself the opportunity and a chance to make this football team, but it's a crowded position and it's a very unfortunate situation over the last three season. You know, you count the off season coming yep. into the draft, you count his year, his time with the Miami Dolphins. It's just unfortunate. And a lot of that has to do with decisions that Dion has made. Yeah, I mean, look, he, he's his own worst. I mean, look, to this point, he's his own worst enemy. I, I mean, the red carpet was rolled out for him and uh, he, they, he was given every opportunity. And unfortunately, you know, he made some bad decisions along the way. He's back here now. But what's the point? I mean, he's not practicing. He, you know, he, he had a knee surgery uh, prior to, right. and then unfortunately, the Dolphins didn't know anything about it because they couldn't communicate with him during his suspension. So, um, you know, to me, it's gone from bad to worse, and, and I just don't see him. Um, I don't see him gaining ground. Not not with these guys going at it the way they're going at it right now in that defensive end position, and and the and the number of quality defensive ends that they've got out there so far. I, I think it's going to be very very difficult. Uh, for him. Uh, Andrew DeLuise. Hey, John, do you think that Mike Hall or Neville Hewitt will de-seat Kiko Alonso? I, I tell you this, you know, Neville Hewitt is a very, very interesting guy out there. Mike Hall, um, great special teams guy. Uh, he, and when he steps in there and plays, he, he goes sideline to sideline. I'm not sure he can unseat Kiko, but uh, Neville Hewitt's another 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 guy out there now. You mentioned those two guys, and they're always around the football. Yeah. You know, special teams, when they get their opportunities on defense, I like the way they play. Mike Hall and Neville Hewitt, they bring speed, they bring tenacity, and they can tackle in the open field. They've done a really good job of that, and they're athletic. They get their hands on the football in the passing lanes. So I don't think they're going to unseat Kiko Alonso. I think that would probably have to, you know, week four, week five, week six, if if you don't get production yeah. out of that position, now you have to look for somebody else and mix and match at linebacker. But I would count on these two players making the roster and making oh, no, an no, impact no. Yeah. on special teams and being ready, uh, you know, next man up at that position, you feel good about those two players. Yeah, I just think Neville Hewitt, I, I think he played well last year towards the end of the year when he got the opportunity to play. Uh, the chances he got with Jelani Jenkins being That's dinged right. up there towards the, the end of the season i think he's a very confident player very athletic guy look i'm not saying that he's going to knock kiko alonso out of the lineup but if kiko doesn't start making some plays start getting off blocks doing those types of things this guy's going to be breathing down his neck there, there's no question about it and he's hungry he wants to play and i know the dolphins uh need somebody out there that can uh, can and, get some and those guys going. are both versatile 
Yeah. Make him do a lot of things. Hey, for John, you. Uh, we got a game, an early game Thursday. There's two more games on Thursday. Friday, Friday, Thursday, Thursday. Right. Pretty weird preseason as far as the way the games are scheduled. And this is the big game here. Uh, what do you expect to see Thursday night up in Orlando? I, I, offensively, I think you're going to have a dependence on the running game. You want to yep. see that offensive line uh, get a lot of work in that first half. I don't think Ryan Tannehill is going to play the entire half. That's my opinion. That may change. Adam Gase ultimately has that decision. But I think a dependence on that running game. And defensively, you want to see these guys be able to go a three and out. You want to get them off the football field, come back out three and out, or at least get some pressure in the pocket, yep. make some open field tackles. And I'd like to see Devontae Parker get a couple looks and the tight end position, quite frankly. I think that's one position we haven't really seen a whole lot out of. So I'd like to see those guys get involved. John, always a pleasure having you, man. Thanks, Bo. I'm sure Appreciate we'll have you, you as buddy. the season goes on a little Absolutely. bit. Absolutely. Look forward to Hometown it. Hometown boy hanging with the Dolphins. Not bad stuff here. I like it. We get fed here everything. John Kajemi, Kim Bo Camper. That's the Audible. Thanks for call. Thanks for sending in your questions. We'll continue to do it every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 4.30, right here. You can catch us. We'll catch you on Wednesday. Have a good evening.